I can kill people in games. I always win. I always win. I never lose a game. But I pretended that I lose to make him happy. I allowed him to win. He says, I got you. Let's play again. Usually I am uh, very sociable and very outspoken and I never miss words. In fact, I have to control them because too many come, you know. Before somebody says something, I have a thousand answers. But uh, when it's about family, last night I didn't expect the surprise and instantly I was a little emotional. I, I was out of words. <laughs> I, I would have preferred to just hide somewhere and just stay alone, you know. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Elder uh, Darren for uh, thinking and about it and the others that worked it together. Anyway, yeah, it was nice to at least to see her, you know. <laughs> I'm going to show you some pictures before we start. Uh, we start with this uh, wonderful uh, T-shirt, Canadian fast food. Do you like it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now let's uh, move fast, go through the pictures because there are many. Here is me and my love, um, 38 years ago, a little more than 38 years ago when we got married. If you look in these pictures, um, uh, it's me and her when we, got, uh, when we got married 30 years ago. What happened? <laughs> Jesus is coming, yeah. Yeah. My Jesus is coming, he's coming again. Yes, and here are my parents and her parents. Look, my mom, my dad, they are almost as good looking as I am. And uh, <laughs> here it is in uh, Barcelona, Spain, at our 25th anniversary. And then um, these are our boys. This is in 2003 or 4 or 2005, I don't remember. Um, the one in uh, white uh, shirt is Gabriel, is the oldest one. And the other one is Ovis, the youngest one. Here they are. Don't they look good? <laughs> yeah. I mean, between me and my wife, how could somebody not look good? You know, I mean. <laughs> 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 this is at Ovis' wedding about eight years ago. And then uh, the, our daughter is in law. Um, the one in white is Denisa. And the other one with Ovi is Kayla. And this is uh, our kids when they were small, Ovi and Gabe. And now this is married. And just about one year ago, that picture. And um, okay, this is me and our older granddaughter, my wife, and the same girl. And then the two of us, and uh, Eva and Gucci. Gucci is the puppy. <laughs> and this is Gucci and Celine. And then uh, in the middle is Eva. And this is Prada, Calvin, Calvin Klein, Celine Dion, Gucci. <laughs> I mean that, I name them. <laughs> These are the grandchildren, except Eva, the oldest one is missing in this picture. Basically, these are Ovi and Kayla's children. It's Ellie and Sam. And here they are. The, the, our youngest uh, boy with their children, Ovi and Kayla and their children. And aren't they sweet? The same kids. And this is Gabe and Denisa and their children, Eva and Esther. Did you see there the ice cream? It looks good. Oh. Okay. And now uh, the whole family, basically, Gabe, Denisa, Eva, and Esther, Ovi, Kayla, Ellie, and Sam, Samuel. <laughs> My mother-in-law, this is last Christmas. Aren't they sweet? The whole family? Did you see Gucci? <laughs> he literally sleeps on my pillow around my head like a crown. And he put his paw on my cheek and if I push, push it away, he puts it back. <laughs> oh. 
Now this is part of my garden. <laughs> Do you see the weight of the tomato? I was holding that. I have a picture with that tomato in my palms holding like this. Look to the eggplant. The eggplant was so long. I have the eggplant in front of me and you cannot see the head. It goes left and right of the head. Yeah. Look to the pepper in my palm. The radishes as big as Fiji apples. Compare the water bottle with the lettuce. So you realize this, or the sweet potatoes with the water. The watermelon, one meter and two centimeters. Don't you love it? Okay, let's switch. Um, let's go three slides before we went a little too far. It should be the title, One with God's Spirit. That's it. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I have good news and good news. Which one do you hear first? <laughs> the good news is that we are here to worship God and to get closer to Him. The other good news is that I have two days and I go home and see my wife. And I may like you, but I like her more. <laughs> um, folks, it's a joy and a privilege to be together. It's a joy to come in God's presence and worship Him and learn about Him. But it's going to be a greater joy when Jesus comes. And that day cannot be described in human words and human mind cannot grasp it. It's beyond any type of imagination. That day, when I was in the army, I was in some type of special forces, a unit called genius. I'm not a genius, but anyway. And, and um, it was hard. It was extreme. They wanted to put me in prison for being an Adventist. It was hard. When I went through those challenges, I thought they are the biggest crisis of my life. Right now, I think about that and I smile. Because God not only that took care of all of it, but turned it into a blessing. The same with this life. When Jesus comes, you are going to look back and smile and say, it was worth. And Paul says that all these trials are not even worthy to be considered compared to the glory to come. Not to mention that that's eternal. Jesus is coming. Coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Do you want to see him? Amen. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Isn't beautiful? But how do you make sure that you are there? How do you make sure? That you are there. There is no way. There is absolutely no way. No method. No strategy. No action. That you or me can do. To assure us heaven. Only God's power. Through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said it's better for you if I go. How could it be better Jesus? We want you to stay with us. It's better for you if I go. Because if I go I'm going to send you the comforter. And he will lead you in all, in all, absolutely all things. There is nothing that you can do without the power of the Holy Spirit. God gave you the comforter to lead you in all things. Spiritual growth, maturity, salvation of family or other souls, preparation for heaven. Uh, in all things, the Holy Spirit will lead you. And without Him, in your power, you cannot do it. The Bible says it's not by mind nor by power, but... By my spirit, says the Lord. And unless we get that in our heads and we practice it in our lives, we will not make it. You need to be not only once in a while connected to the spirit. You need not only in a while to have a little oil. You need to be filled by the spirit, led by the spirit, fully controlled by the spirit. I'm going to give you an example as we start. And uh, I think... I think it's a good example, but 
We will see. Um, I have a friend, I'm not going to tell the name, very good man. His father was a, mis- a pastor and a missionary for over 35 years. This friend of mine was born in mission and he lived 31 years in mission and then returned back home to the U.S. Uh, very well to do, very smart. He has done things that the whole world is using. For instance, when you open your cell phone and you go to maps and you put an address on Google Maps and the cell phone leads you to that address. Because of him you have those maps. And so on and so forth. I'm not going to go too much in details. Oh, long ago, before cell phones and Google Maps and so on, you would have a, a book and you're driving and your wife would tell you, take a left, get on this exit and you say, fast, fast, the exit is coming. You, know? <laughs> you remember those Rang McNally books, maps? Okay. He was behind, behind those two. So this friend of mine, this friend of mine, I was going to church, driving back home, next Sabbath going to church. I was preaching. You need to be led by the Spirit. You need to be controlled by the Spirit. You need to be used by the Spirit. You need to be uh, des- developed by the Spirit. You need to be saved by the Spirit. The Spirit has to totally work in your life. Otherwise, you'll never do it. And I said, how do you know? that you have the spirit. How do you measure it? What is the thermometer that would measure your spiritual temperature? How do you know? And the Bible is pretty simple. You'll know them by their fruits. The fruit of the spirit is. Exactly. Thank you. And I said, but there is another measurement that the Bible talks about and the spirit of prophecy talks about. In 1 John chapter 5, he says that if you say that you love God, but you don't love your neighbor, the love of God is not in you. You are a liar. Whoa. So, <coughs> excuse me, you look around, and if you don't like your neighbor, if you look around, do you like people that you see? Huh? <laughs> tell them you look good tonight. Even if you have to lie, just tell them. <laughs> you look amazing tonight. <laughs> if, you, if you, it's easy to love this group. But if you don't love your enemy, If you don't love those that really make your life miserable, the love of God is not in you. You don't have to agree with them, but you need to feel pity for them. You need to say, forgive them because they really don't know what they do. You follow me? So I told him, that's how you know if you have the Spirit. And I said, this is how you know if you have the Spirit. If you really love God, you have a passion for people. The Spirit of Prophecy says that when you love God, you have a passion for people. This is how you know. If you don't care for people, you don't care for God. Jesus told you, is not called the great suggestion. It's called the great commission. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. If you can, Jesus commanded you to save the world. It's the mission of the church. The Spirit of Prophecy says that if the church stops saving the world, the church loses the purpose for existence, should be locked, closed, and everybody home. If the church stops doing mission, the church should be closed. And so, I told him that. Do you have a passion for people? Oh yeah, I, I do love people. Really? How do you love people? Well, when we go to church, I give them a hug. Really? <laughs> if I give you a hug, and you are in need, and I don't help you, do I love you? It's like, to my wife, I give you a hug and then leave me alone. I'm not going to help you. I gave you a hug. What, what, you know, what else do you want? <laughs> How do you care for your neighbor? You give a hug to the neighbor? He says, Pastor, you don't know my neighbors. You cannot give a hug to my neighbors. <laughs> In that time, I had a Kiario. In, who knows Kiario? Not the Kiario that you know now. The Kiario in 2003, 2004, it was more like Mr. Bean's car. You keep your knees in your mouth. <laughs> really small. Looking very ugly, you know. It was long ago. Right now, Kia looks good. In that time, it was... Yeah, I'm not going to say too much. And my wife entered the garage too much to the left and hit all the left side. was... And my father-in-law hit a bus and hit all the right side. And the friend from Spain backed into a truck and pushed the trunk of the car. That car was beaten all over. (laughs) Only the front was okay. And then the covers from the rotors, from the brakes, were bent and were touching the rotors. And when you drive, it would do... 
when I would go Sabbath morning to church, people would hear, hey, the pastor came. <laughs> and, and he says to me, pastor, you don't know my neighbors. It's impossible to love my neighbors. It's impossible to reach my neighbors. I could reach poor people because I give them a meal and then invite them to church. But my neighbors are multi, multi, multi millionaires. My neighbors are extremely private. They don't come if you send them invitation to evangelism or to Bible studies. They don't come. You cannot go and offer to pray with them. You cannot go and give them a Bible study. You cannot talk to them about church. Those people don't even greet you. Those people are extremely private. Come and see. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm to come. I'm going to come. No worries. I took my key. Are you? you know? And I went to visit him. I drove far away, close to Chicago, around the lake, very exclusive neighborhood, big gates. There was a guy in a little, in a little room in front of the gate, and he, you know, he was paid to guard, you know, the, the exclusive neighborhood. And I stop in front of him, he says, open the gate, man. And he looks through the window down to my car, and he says, you are in the wrong neighborhood. <laughs> I said, no, I'm in the right neighborhood. No, what are you doing here? I said, I am visiting so-and-so. He says, really? He took the telephone and called my elder and says, there is a crazy guy in a broken key, are you? In a junk car, he says that he's here to visit. Oh, that's my pastor, let him in. He says, oh, okay. He opened the gate and I'm driving Kia Rio and I, Maserati, <laughs> BMW, Lexus, you know. Uh, you get the picture, you know. Bentley, Porsche, Mercedes. And big, 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 gigantic homes around the lake, like six, seven, eight million dollars. But I don't know, gigantic homes, beautiful homes. I mean, you would open your mouth and like, wow, you know. And I stop at his house and he invites me in. His wife is from Greece. She cooks the best food. You, you would think that you are already in heaven. I mean, she had a uh, Mediterranean salad with kalamata olives and, and feta cheese. And I mean, this, that salad, I even have water in my mouth right now, just talking about <laughs> And, and she cooked stuffed cabbage rolls, if you know what that is, really good. I mean, I ate until I needed a crane to get up. I mean, she, she had moussaka, if you know what moussaka is, and then she had, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to remember, some sweets that they are made in Turkey, and they have baklava. Ah! Oh heaven. And I ate and I said, you should start a restaurant. He says, no, I don't need a restaurant. I have enough stress. We are okay. We don't need another business. And uh, I ate and then I said, okay, let's talk. In my mind, after I ate, I don't even want to talk, you know. <laughs> let's talk. And he says, did you see these homes? Yes. Do you see people around? No. Do you think that these people would come to evangelism or to our church? These people don't talk to each other, even in the family. They are all divorced. They are all, their children don't talk to them. Do you think that they will respond to me? And I said, brother, rich people have diabetes like poor people. Rich people have cancer like, rich people have divorce like poor people. Rich people, you follow me? Need Jesus like poor people. Everybody needs salvation. I said, it's your fault that they don't listen. He said, what? Why would it be my fault? How much have you been praying for them? Why well, do you pray for them? I said, I didn't ask you if you pray for them. I asked you, how long have you been praying for them? He says, I don't know. That means that you didn't pray. He says, what do you mean? If you don't know how long you prayed, it means you didn't pray. He says, what do you mean? Let me explain. If you fast one minute, you don't know. If you fast five days, trust me, you know. <laughs> if you pray one minute, you don't know. If you pray three months, you do know. When you don't know how much you prayed, it means you didn't pray. He says, well, I don't have that time to pray three months for them. Exactly what I told you. You are not a Christian. He said, what? I said, you don't care for them. Because if you care, if you told your children, you would pray for them three months or six months. If your kid has an accident, is in ER dying, you don't pray one minute. You pray life and death prayer. You plead with God. You follow me? Like Jacob, you say, I'm not going to let you go. If you don't pray that way for the neighbors, stop coming to church. Whoa. He said, Pastor, aren't you too harsh? I said, no, I should be harsher than this. I am too kind. I mean, what do you want me to do? Oh, you look good. You are a good Christian. God bless you. I'm glad you give tithe. I said, unless you pray for the neighbors, 
with desperation and say, Lord, take my life and save my neighbors. You're not a Christian. And that's how you know when Jesus comes, you'll not be in heaven. What do you want me to do, pastor? I just told you. Pray for the neighbor. Say, Lord, I don't know what to do, but you do tell me what to do to reach my neighbors. And Lord, by the way, I'm not going to stop praying until you either answer or kill me. I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to grab you and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and ask and until you do something about it. He says, Pastor, do you want me to be so serious in prayer? I said, duh. <laughs> what, do you want to be not serious in prayer or what? He says, I've never done that in my life. I said, well, it's time for you to be baptized. <laughs> he was like, stop joking, pastor. I said, I'm not joking. He said, I will think about it. I said, no, don't think about it. Just do it. He started to pray for the neighbors. He called me a couple of months later and he said, pastor, I've been an Adventist all my life. My parents, my grandparents, I'm a fourth generation Adventist. I am a PK. You know what PK means? Pastor kid. And I am an MK. What is that? Missionary kid. He said, I am a PK. I am an MK. I know all the doctrines. I return faithful tight. I support the church. I thought I am okay. And I just now, after two months of praying for my neighbors, realized that I was not okay. He said, since I started to pray, my kids that would never listen to me started to listen. And we sense heaven in our home. I sense God's presence. Ellen White says, Ellen White says, that is the duty of the parents every morning to invite God's presence in their family so Satan has less access to their family. He says, I can sense God's presence in our family. My wife and I get along really well. I can sense God's presence when I go to work. I am inspired and I know when to talk, when not to talk, how to deal with my co-workers, he says, since I started to pray this way, my life has changed. He says, I am still an Adventist, but now I can sense God's presence. I can sense that he walks with me. He says, I never had that experience before. Whoa, doesn't the Bible say that God wants to talk to us? He says, my sheep know my. Huh? And so, or he who has ears to hear what the Spirit says. And he said, it changed my life, my spiritual life. I'm going to keep praying for the neighbors because that is growing me. A few months later, he called me and says, Pastor, you remember what you told me? I told you so many things. Which one? To start a restaurant. I said, yeah, I do remember. I was praying and praying and praying. I said, Lord, give me an idea how to reach the neighbors. I'm not going to let you go. And God said to me, invite them to eat Greek food. And I said to him, well, when you invite them, you can invite me too. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, Pastor, these people don't care for church. These people don't care for Bible studies. But these people worship food. They drive far away for a good, exclusive, expensive restaurant. And they are very curious to taste new foods. So I'm going to tell them about my wife's food. And I prayed, and God inspired me, if they say no, to describe the food, because they will not resist that description. I said, God bless you, please don't describe it to me. <laughs> and then he called me later. He says, Pastor, let me tell you the story. And the story is like, like this. He says, it was Sunday morning, I see my neighbor cleaning the Porsche a little, I don't know, the dust or something happened. He was looking, doing something to his Porsche. And I said, good morning. And the guy says, uh, good morning. How are you doing? Good. You? Hey, today is our anniversary, my wife and I, 25 years. Oh, congratulations. Hey, would you come and eat with us so we don't eat alone? No, thank you. And he says, let me tell you, we have Greek food. We have, and he started to describe the stuffed cabbage rolls and the stuffed peppers and the moussaka, and, you know. And, and he says the neighbor stopped cleaning the car, opened big mouth, and he froze, and he was listening. And he said, I was describing the food. And I could see that he could not reach his, oh, okay, I can come a little. <laughs> and the neighbor comes, and he says, in my family, we never eat without praying. So let's pray. And the neighbor says, I don't pray. Well, that's okay. I pray. Close your eyes. He says, he closed his eyes. 
And I, the, the, my elder says, tell me what to pray for. He says, well, I don't know. Well, tell me, I want to pray for you, not only for food. Tell me what to pray for you. Well, my wife and I have been separated for five years. We live in, a, in the same house, so we don't involve lawyers, but we don't talk to each other. Our kids are teenagers. They don't even greet us. They are ashamed of us. They spend all their day on the cell phone. They hate us. Would you pray for my crazy family? I said, I prayed for his family. I prayed for the food. And then we ate. And he was eating and eating and eating. And he says, man, you should open a restaurant. <laughs> <coughs> And he says, we ate, and after we ate, the guy says, this is the best food I've ever had. I cannot even resist. I'm so glad you invited me. Thank you. I just had the best experience. And so my elder prayed in his mind as Nehemiah in front of the king. Lord, what, should, what to do next? And he asked me before when we talked, should I tell him about Sabbath? I said, God forbid, please don't. Just build friendship. Christ method alone. Build friendship. And when God gives you an opportunity, then you do more. And so he says, hey, neighbor, we ate. Let's play a game. And the guy says, what? Let's play a game. We are adults. When is the last time when you had fun? In college? Come on, man. Why do you work? I, I ask myself, why do we work so hard and have so much money if we never have fun? Yeah, but games... Uh, yeah, let's play a game. I don't play games. Come on. And he said, God inspired me to negotiate like Abraham. I said, if I would say, let's play 10 minutes, he would have said no. Let's play one hour. Oh, I don't have one hour. Okay, 45 minutes. No. 30 minutes. No, no, no. 15 minutes. No. Come on, man. 10 minutes is not going to kill you. Don't tell me that you cannot spare 10 minutes. Yes. Come on. You are going to love it. Just 10 minutes. I promise. Next time we just eat. Just 10 minutes. I don't know how to play. I'm going to teach you. Don't worry. Ten minutes. Five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Okay. He said, we played Monopoly and Settlers of Catan. Who knows Settlers of Catan? Anybody here? It's amazing. Okay. And he said, I can kill people in games. I always win. I always win. I never lose a game. But I pretended that I lose to make him happy. I allowed him to win. And he says, I got you. Let's play again. They play second game. He said, I allow him to win again. So he really loves it. He said, I won again. Let's play again. I said, now that's too much. So I won again. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> and then after I won, he was kind of sad. So I, I said, let's play the fourth one. And I allow him to win. And then we stopped. So he would go happy home, you know. And so they played four games. The neighbor got three. And my elder got one. The third game, you know. And so... The neighbor left literally whistling. Whistling. He enters his house, whistling. And the kids look and Dad, we have never seen you whistling. What's wrong with you? I went to that guy and we ate Greek food and we ate this and this and that. Unbelievable food. And then we played games and I beat him. And the kids, you never play with us? You are always busy. You work at work. You work at home. You work until 10 p.m. You tell us to leave you alone. And you play with him. Yeah. And I told him, I love it. Next Sunday, I go back. And the kids, can we come? Let me call him. Can my kids come? Yeah. Yeah, you can come. He goes upstairs and the wife says, the kids talk to you? Yes. But they don't talk to me. What did you give them? A new laptop or what? A new cell phone? Oh, no. I just told them that I went to the neighbor. We ate Greek food and we played games. And the wife says, are you crazy? You lost your mind. You play games. You are an adult. Are you sick? What's wrong with you? I don't care what you think. I am happy. I've never had so much fun in the last 25 years. You know what? Next Sunday, I go back and the kids come with me. The kids come? Yes. Can I come? <laughs> Next Sunday, the whole family. They prayed. They ate. They prayed. Next Sunday again, next Sunday again, next Sunday again, next Sunday again. They got friends and they got used to eat, to pray for one another and to play games. And they would say, it's fun. We love playing together. And then one Sunday, this neighbor plays golf with another crazy rich neighbor. And he says, my family is back together. My wife loves me. I love her. My kids talk to me. They love me. And he says, who did you go to for counseling? Oh, nobody. 
is, is just we go to their neighbor and we pray together and we eat and we play games. And the other the guy says, are you crazy? You pray and you play? He says, hey, I don't care what you think. It works. Since we do that, my kids love us. And we are just playing together and praying together and talking to you. Just put the family back together. My kids are friends with me. And my wife loves me. So it works. And the other neighbor says, well, can I come with my wife? <laughs> Two years later, 11 rich families every Sunday praying, eating, playing. And my elder would call me and say, it works. Rich people can be rich too. And he said, should I now tell them about Sabbath? I said, no. Pray for opportunities. Otherwise, they think that you had an agenda and you do. So just be patient. <coughs> pray for opportunities. Pray that God would open the door. When they ask you, then refuse to tell them. Let them beg for it. It came. One Sunday they said, tell us about you. You are different. Every Saturday you get in, in a costume, you get in the car with your family, you don't drink, you are happy, you play together. You Tell us about you. What do you believe? He says, no, nah, religion is private. I'm not going to tell. Please, no. Please, okay. <laughs> <laughs> One year and a half, two years down the road, I baptized 70 rich millionaires. And they started a church. And the police officer. And, and so on and so forth. They told me, don't come with Kia, please. We are going to give you a ride. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, listen carefully. If you put your knee down and say, Lord, I want to reach my neighbors. And Lord, I'm not going to play games this time. I'm going to pray until you lead me and you help me. When you are serious about it, then God is going to work. You follow me? That's how you know that you really love God. If you don't care for the neighbor, it's easy to go to church and sing Kumbaya. Oh, we feel so high. But that doesn't make you a Christian. So let's go to the subject. How do you prepare for heaven? How do you know that you are saved? How do you know? The Bible says that you know by their fruits. You know if you love your neighbor. That's how you know that you love God. But let's go a little deeper. The Bible says that the kingdom of heaven, hold on a second, what's going on here? We are not in the proper slide. Are you? It's not the proper slide. This I don't know what is wrong. It's not the proper one. Yes, this is it. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, listen carefully, do you want to be in the kingdom? Yes. The kingdom of heaven, if you want to be there, listen carefully. Jesus, in Matthew 24, talked about the end of the world, and then in, at the end of 24 and beginning of 25, he gives them four parables to tell them how to prepare to make sure that they are in the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like how many? Ten. Why ten? Why not twelve? Why not seven? Why ten? So let me tell you why ten. When the priest would go to the temple to serve and they would switch the shift and these ten that were here for several months leave, another ten would come. Never twelve, never seven, never eight, never forty, never. When they would go to serve, the priest would go to serve at the temple, they would go in groups of ten. And the whole Israel knew that. So when Jesus said ten virgins, everybody knew that it's about service for God. The priest that serve. And remember, the Bible says that you are a kingdom of all of us. In Exodus 19 and 1 Peter. Remember that. We all are supposed to serve. You follow me? So, ten, right away, they knew when Jesus started to talk and said, ten, they knew it's about service. And then, the, 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 the virgins, they are virgins. What does it mean? It means that they are pure. Okay? And they had lamps. And they went to meet the bridegroom. 
and five of them are wise and five of them are foolish. Who are the church? Who is the world? I got you. Don't answer because this is a tricky question. Who are the world and who is the church? All are the church. Because they are all virgin. It's not that five are virgins and five are... You follow me? It's not that five are in white and five are in red scarlet like the, the prostitute woman in Revelation. It's not. All ten are virgins, pure church. All ten are in white. That is Christ robe of... All ten are in white. All ten have lamps. What is the lamp? Listen carefully. What you say? What is the lamp? Not the oil. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. They have the word. Now listen carefully. Proverbs chapter 6. Your commandments are a lamp and your law is the light. Says in Proverbs. So what is the lamp? Not only the word. The Ten Commandments. What church has the word and the Ten Commandments? Now listen carefully. They all ten wait for the coming of the... Who is waiting for Jesus to come? Who is the parable talking about? It's talking about us. You and me. All ten. Now listen carefully. They are virgin. They are dressed in white. Righteousness. They have the lambs, the word, and the commandments. They are waiting for the second coming. Nevertheless, in the church... Five are wise and five are less wise, not to say foolish. And they take oil with them or take no oil. What does it mean? It's not only the oil in the lamp because they all had oil in the lamp. They all had light in the beginning. To have light, you need to have oil. Otherwise, there is, if there is no oil, there is no light. But while they sleep, the oil ends. You understand? And some of them have reserve oil and some of them don't. They had, according to the tradition and the history, they had the lamp that was very small. I have a picture with it. And they had a clay container with reserve oil. The lamp would burn four hours and the reserve container would burn eight hours. So you could fill the lamp twice. That means all together, do the geography. Four plus eight. The mathematics, come on. It's 12 hours. It would last through the night. Why lamp to hold the oil? Why oil? The oil is the? Why oil? Ellen White says that the Holy Spirit comes for a purpose. Doesn't come in vain. Comes for a purpose. Comma, to enable us for, mi for ministry. Came over Jesus to prepare him for his ministry. Comes over you because you cannot do it alone. Came over the disciples to enable them for their mission. The Holy Spirit comes for a purpose. Why oil in the lamp? So the lamp could have what? Light, flame, fire. Does it baptize you spirit and fire? So you could have fire. Okay, now listen carefully. They all had lamps when they got baptized. They all had oil when they got baptized. Just some of them don't have reserve oil. Do you understand so far? Okay. Now, how many of them fall asleep? How many? Including the wise? Everybody? Really? All ten? Not nine? All ten fell asleep? By the sleeping disciples representing a sleeping... Oh. When? Right before the second coming. Christ is at the door. Men and women are in the last hours of probation. Jesus is coming. And yet, they are foolish. And the preachers have no power to wake them up because the preachers sleep too. Sleeping preachers preaching to sleeping members. That's in the spirit of prophecy. It's not me. So who is sleeping now? Who? Including me? It says everybody. All ten. So that means that I am preaching while sleeping. But I am not sleeping, and you are not sleeping. I am watching you. If you are sleeping, when I was young, I had a, a, a big straw, very thick, with rice. I was at the balcony, and whoever was sleeping in the church, I would shoot them in the head with rice. <laughs> I mean that. You ask the pastor, he's retired. People would nap, and they would wake up and look to make sure that I didn't notice them, because they knew I would shoot them in the head with rice. And I am watching. I don't have the rice with me, but you are not sleeping. So what does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? 
What does it mean? The whole church is sleeping. What does it mean? Could it be, I'm going to give you suggestions, you decide for yourself, could it be that they are sleeping to the events, to the urgency of the preparation? Satan keeps them ignorant. They think that it's going to be another fight. Jesus comes soon, but not now. <laughs> they are so blind, they say, when, I, when we are going to see the final events, we wake up. Hello? You are not going to see the final events because they are already around you and you don't see them. Because the final events don't come suddenly. They come like the pregnancy contractions. That means that they come gradually. It's not that we had no earthquakes, no fires, no nothing. An instant you have 3,000 earthquakes and 3,000 fires. No! It's one every 50 years and then it's one every 40 years and then it's one every 10 years and then it's one every one year and then the five a year and then 100 a year and then 500. In time, they grow gradually and because they grow in time, you get used and you think it's normal. And you consider it, this crisis, normal. It's a new normal. And you get used to the crisis and you look for the crisis and you don't realize that you are in crisis. And you say, when the crisis comes, I'm going to, hello, the crisis came long ago. You just got used to it. You follow me? And so they are sleeping to the urgency of the time and they don't prepare. They don't take it serious. That's the reason God allows some things to wake us up because he loves us. He told the, the disciples, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by, then it's time for you to run. Who obeyed was saved. Who didn't obey perished. The same with us. When you see this happening, it's time for you to wake up and prepare. Who listens will be saved. You follow me? So could be sleeping the 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 ignorance to the signs around us. But could be something else. Peter was sleeping in prison. Am I right? Why? Because they were planning to kill him next day. Why? You go to the book of Acts of the Apostles and she says, because he knew, he was sleeping because he knew that he is safe in God's hands because God is in control. He felt safe. Jesus was sleeping in the boat. Storm, the disciples panic. Don't you care that we perish? And Jesus is like a baby. <sniffs> Why? You go to the side of ages and he sa it says there that he knew that his father controls the sea. He felt safe. Can it be that sleeping it's a symbol of our fake safety, a false sense of security. We are Adventists, we have the truth, we know the doctrines, we know the state of the dead, we just don't know the state of the living, but we are Adventists, so we are safe. And we don't realize that we are not safe. And Jesus is coming. You follow me? Sleeping to our situation. You think you are, but you don't know how you are. Sleeping to our state. You follow me? They all, how many of them? They all sleep. Now, the, the cry is heard. The groom is coming. Ellen Rice says that those are the events that would wake up the church. How many of them wake up? How many? Including the foolish. So there is no difference. They all have lamps. They all have oil. They are all dressed in white. They all go to sleep. They all wake up. There is no difference between foolish and wise. But when they wake up, they do something pretty strange. What does the Bible say? They go to trim their lamps. You know what that means? That means that they are not aware that they don't have oil. Because if you don't have oil, you never trim your lamp. If they go to trim their lamps, it means that they know that they have oil. So they are in such a bad shape, so blind, that they have no connection with God, and they think they do. So blinded, so secure. And they realize too late that they have been fooling themselves. You follow me? Until that moment, nobody knows that they have no oil. They are safe, sleeping. And then they try to recover. Can we get oil from you? You cannot borrow relationship with God. You need to develop it yourself. You follow me? Very sad. 1.6 million people 
the history says. The Bible says 600,000 men for army. 600,000 men plus wives, plus children, plus elderly, plus left Egypt. Only two entered Canaan. Also, Jesus says from two in the field, one is going to be taken, one is going to be left. You remember? So you look here. Who is going to be taken? Who is going to be left? I am in. What about you? <laughs> How do you make sure that you are in? So you don't go to trim and, oops, I have no oil. And that's too late. How do you make sure? What is the difference between the saved and the lost? It's one thing that Jesus says. Listen carefully, folks, because this is the answer. When they got baptized, they all had oil. But after that, some of them kept going to church, kept doing the right things, kept reading the Sabbath school lesson, kept, you know, they did everything like all the others. But they got distracted with other things. And they didn't have time. They had other priorities. They didn't have time to go again and again and again and again and again every day to go back and fill the reserve container with oil. And their oil is still there, but a little less today, a little less tomorrow, and slowly, um, it's not even visible, slowly the oil goes lower and lower and they fall asleep and the oil is still there. Because they don't go daily to fill the container. To have it always full, always full, always full. The wise ones, every morning, they make it a priority above anything, above anything, above anything, at any risk. They don't care if they lose life or job or anything because this is the priority. Every morning, they make a... a he awakens my ear every morning to listen as I did. Jesus early in the morning. You, you follow me? They love that time. Every morning they go to prayer and they go to study. Not as a duty, but to fill themselves with God's presence. They desire that time. They thirst as a deer is thirsty. They thirst for that time. They love that time. It becomes air. They cannot breathe without. They cannot function without. They live with it. They have a passion for it. And they are daily filled with God's presence. And they learn to walk with him and to talk with him and to depend on him and to be controlled by him and to sense his presence in their life. They are filled with oil. And that makes a world of difference. Do you have oil or not? Because that's what decides your eternity. Do you understand what I am trying to say? If you think about it, we need to jump because we already talked about this. <clears throat> you see the Bible verse, Proverbs 6, the commandment's a lamp and the law a light. Did you know about this verse? You did, you did, okay. So I want to make a point here. I want to make a point about those who are daily, who are daily, what the word is daily, the word is daily, those who are daily filled, daily filled with oil. Listen, folks, it's good to be baptized? Yes. Oh, yes, praise the Lord, hallelujah. But it's not enough. It's good to get married? Yes, yes but it's not enough. You need to stay married. <laughs> and you need to grow in love. It's good to go to school? But it's not enough. You need to graduate. <laughs> you follow me? The same with the oil, folks. When I was about 17, 18, 19, somewhere there, before 20s, the pastor took us to the Black Sea camping. There were about 25, 26, 27 young people, boys and girls, in, in the church. And at the Black Sea, there is a lake close to the sea, called Tekirgyol. That lake is gigantic. If I show you pictures on the map, it's about 10 kilometers long and about five, six kilometers wide. It's extremely salty, like the Salt Lake City or whatever, salty, and you cannot cross the lake. Because when you get in the lake, when you look from this shore, you go down the...
and then you get to the salty water. When you get in the lake, on the other side, on the other shore, far away, several kilometers, you see the homes, so small. But when you, that's when you are standing. When you get down the sand, down the sand, down the sand, you get in the water, you walk in the water, down and down, and you get to the water right here, because of the waves, because there is always wind, you don't see the other end. And when you swim 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes into the lake, you don't see anything around because of the waves and your head being at that level. And you swim 1 hour and you swim 2 hours and you don't know, am I going the right direction or am I going in circles like Israel, 40 years again, we are marching to Zion. No, you are marching in circles. <laughs> and you are going to die in the wilderness. Am I dying in the lake? And people, after 2, 3, 4 hours, they just give up. They don't know. Am I going straight or left or right? or in? They don't know because they don't see anything. And the pastor said, who can cross the lake? And the young people, me, 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 everybody, me, you know. I called my father. I said, daddy, how do you make sure that you win the race? I want to cross the lake. He said, son, don't let anything distract you. Nothing. Doesn't matter if you live or die. Doesn't matter what you lose. Have one focus alone. Keep your eyes on the target. Don't think. Don't talk. Don't breathe. Don't do anything. Don't even greet people. Don't. Don't. Just no distractions. One goal alone. And he said, you'll make it. I said, okay. He says, have a rhythm and keep the rhythm. I said, okay. I got in the water. Everybody got in the water. The pastor and two other parents with boats. He said, if you get tired, get in the boat. Okay? And we started to swim. All the Rambos, all the Schwarzeneggers, all the Terminators, like, ho, 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 ho. Shh. Me? Slow. I started to, 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 to sing. Pam, pa, pam, pam, pa, pam, pam, pa, pam. Pam, pa, pam. And I was moving like a snail, you know. They... Me, pam, 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 and I got from behind, and I caught them, and I passed them, and they look, hey, pa passed us, and they started again, chup, 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 and they caught up with me, and passed me a little, and then, <laughs> me, pam, 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 hey, Pavel, take a break, pam, 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 hey, man, do you hear us, pam, 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 and I passed them, and I passed, and I went farther and farther, slow, but continue. Slow, but continue, continue, continue. Eventually, they, <laughs> but they could not keep up with me anymore, and one by one got into the boat. Eventually, me and my friend were alone in the water. So the pastor comes to the boat and says, Pavel, get in the boat. What do you think that I said? <laughs> pam, 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 pam. <laughs> hey, man, get in the boat. There is nobody to compete with. Pam, pam, pam. <laughs> Death, blind, didn't care, didn't hear, didn't talk. Hey, man, get in the boat. We don't have the, do the whole day to wait for you. Get in the boat. Eventually, I got angry. I said, leave me alone. You are going to die. Happy to die. Bye. <laughs> we go. Go. Leave me alone. Pam, pam, pam. Pam, 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 pam. Five hours later, I was on the other side. They were waiting, eating, drinking, joking, having fun. They said, okay, you came, let's get in the boat. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't get it. He, they said, what? I got a little orange juice. I got a piece of chocolate. I jumped in the water. Pam, pa, pam, 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 pam. Another five hours and a half back. About 11 hours. How do you make it? Don't let anything distract you from the goal. There is no, no other goal. Nothing is worth distracting you from the goal. Because whatever distracts you is going to lose you. And that's what the foolish did. They got distracted. And they thought they are okay. And they go to trim their lamps. And they don't realize just because they go to church doesn't mean that they have the presence. They are destitute of the Holy Spirit, destitute of oil. They confuse forms with relationship. Do you follow me? They feel safe. 
that they have all the forms and they don't realize they have no oil. There is no connection with God. Long ago, they broke the connection. But because they keep going with the forms, they think they will be saved. Lord, we've been going to church. I don't know you. Think about it, folks. Jesus is coming. You want to be there. When the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to convince all of sin, righteousness, and judgment. What is the job of the Spirit? What is to convince you of sin? It's justification. Righteousness is sanctification. Judgment is glorification. What does it mean? It's not that the Holy Spirit gets you baptized and that's it. After you get baptized, the Holy Spirit has to grow you. And the Holy Spirit has to save you. And the Holy Spirit has to use you. And there is nothing that you do by yourself. All the process is based on God's power. As soon as you disconnect, process stops happening. You need to stay connected so the process continues. The swimming doesn't stop. You need to continue to grow more and more to the statue of fullness of Christ. Closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to Jesus. As soon as you get distracted, the process stops. Do you follow me? The wise fill the container daily. The spirit of prophecy says, the key is that they filled it daily. You cannot afford one day without God. One day without God is lost for eternity. You need to go back to God every day. Now listen, we got to finish, so I'm going to jump a little. A revival of true godliness is the greatest, more urgent of our needs. To seek this should be our first work. Now listen carefully. It happens only in answer to prayer, the last sentence. Without the Spirit, I want you to hear this. All the knowledge that we have is of no avail. You can know everything. You can know all the doctrines. If you have the doctrines without the God of the doctrines, it doesn't help. We should have both. Listen. The theory without the Holy Spirit cannot sanctify the heart. You may know the commandments, the promises. Unless the Spirit to set the truth home, move it from here to here, the character will never be transformed. Do you understand? You need the Spirit for the whole process. So like the ten virgins is to the church before the second coming is talking to us. They are destitute of oil. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They believe the truth. They preach the truth. But they are content with a superficial religion. Their service to God degenerates into forms. Do you understand? They have not entered into the fellowship with Christ. And they don't know the language of heaven. Saddest of all words. The fellowship of the spirit that you neglected could alone prepare you for the marriage. Very profound. Why did they have to have oil? In order to have fire and light. Why did they have to have light? Because in that tradition, the adults would prepare the wedding feast and the young would take lamps and go to all the streets, all the intersections, because there was no lights, the streets had no names, the streets were like, like a maze, like a labyrinth, confusing. All the youth, weddings happen in the night because during the day it was too hot. All the youth would go to the intersections and light the way from the entrance in the city to the wedding hall. So nobody gets lost. Jesus says you are the light of the world. And the spirit of prophecy says that we are supposed to light the way to the people around us. And if we don't light the way, we have no spirit. Because if we have the Holy Spirit, the oil, we will light the way. So nobody around us will be lost. God makes you responsible for those precious souls. And if you love Jesus, you love them and you are full of the Spirit and you are a light and you are salt and you are a blessing and you, are, you show God in your life. You see? To shed light into the darkness. To lighten the path to the wedding hall. Do you see it? It's right there. We need to finish. Be in the position that we are. We need to be awake, holy, devoted, fully consecrated. But we seem to be paralyzed. God of heaven, wake us up, please. I'm going to jump. The 
The promise of the Spirit is essential to the church in the last days. If the fulfillment is not seen, is because the promise is not appreciated. If all are willing, all will be filled with oil. Minor matters occupy our attention and the divine power necessary for growth that would bring all the other blessings in his train is lacking, talking about the Spirit. How much do you pray for the Spirit? How much do you plead, Lord, I need your spirit. I need you. I need you every hour. If God is to bless his church in the last day, it's because the doctrine of the spirit is not only studied, but sought after with the whole heart. Ministers and congregations should bow down with one cry. We have grieved the Holy Spirit because we try to be Christians without the spirit. We have not filled our churches with the spirit. If you don't have the spirit, it would be better to close the churches. If our minister don't have the spirit, they should not even preach. I think I don't speak too strongly when I say a land, a church in the land without the spirit is rather a curse than a blessing. Since this is the means by which we are to receive power, why don't we hunger? Why don't we pray? Why don't we talk about the spirit? The Lord is willing to give his spirit. Listen, for the daily baptism of the spirit, every worker should offer his petition to God. Companies of Christians should gather together whenever two or three. Especially they should pray that God would baptize the workers in the church with a rich measure of the spirit. Isn't that powerful? How much do you pray for that? The paragraph is pretty clear. In the great and measureless gift of the spirit are contained all heaven's resources. It's not because of any restriction on God's part that we don't receive the Holy Spirit. If we are willing, we all will be filled. This promise, if claimed with faith, will bring all other blessings in its train. Now listen carefully. The reception of the spirit is the greatest need of the church today. Let us pray for the spirit. There is no limit, no limit to the usefulness of one who put himself aside, makes room for the Holy Spirit. Isn't that powerful? Why do we have limits? Near the close of harvest, the second coming. Listen, the outpouring of the Spirit, the outpouring of the Spirit is going to be the power, the power that would finish the work. If there was ever a time when we need the Spirit, we need it now. Folks, let's finish. My time is up kind of long ago. <laughs> I got excited about it. I want to give you a story and finish with it. When I was in College Dale in Southern Adventist University, one of my teachers, Dr. Cluzet, we had a weekend of revival, and he told us a story. And he said, my wife and I, love each other, we have a good family, we get along really well, but we had a conflict. She said, why God doesn't answer my prayers? And he answers your prayers, just because you are a pastor? I said, no, God answers everybody's prayers. It's just you don't pray. <laughs> oh, yes, I do pray. No, you don't. I pray the whole night and plead with God for something, I don't pray every night that way. But when I pray, I spend quality time in prayer and study. You pray quick. And she says, because I have a real job. Pfft. When they tell me that, that as a pastor I don't have a real job, I feel like dismembership, disfellowshipping them, you know. <laughs> Why do you say disfellowship? Because he's not a fellow, he's a member. You should say dismembership, you know. But anyway, you didn't get it, okay. <laughs> they are not fellows, so you don't disfellow. They are members, so you dismember, <laughs> okay. Okay, let's leave it alone. And so she says, I have a real job. I need to sleep. He says, no, you love sleep more than you love relationship with God. No, I love God. That's what you like to think. If you really love God, you wake up early and spend time with him. If you don't do that, you just think you love God and you fool yourself and you are destitute of his presence. What do you want me to do? Very simple. Wake up early and spend time with him. Well, I sleep hard. I cannot wake up. And he told us she was sleeping so hard that you could split wood on her body and she would not wake up, you know. He said that they had an old clock with two things and the hammer above. You know what I'm talking? And when the alarm would go off, the hammer would, and she would put it in a stainless steel with forks around. When the hammer would go off, the forks would jump. And she, he said it would take about five minutes for her to wake up. And, and, and he says... We have an old 
uh, the old, in that time, it was in 98, I believe, in that time, an old um, answering machine that has a little tape and you have to rewind and then listen to the messages. You know what I'm talking about? You must be old if you know. Anyway, and so, and he said we had a color ID that has big red letters and he said the answering machine would kick in after four rings if you didn't pick up. And he said, I told her, you need to put your alarm clock to wake you up one or two hours earlier. And before you go to work, you need to fill your container with oil. You should never live without being filled with God's presence. It's not safe to step out alone. You are exposed to Satan's fiery arrows. You follow me? You need to be covered by the armor of God. Covered. In the Greek it says panoplia. But it means a hedge of protection. Covered with the spirit. And she says, but I sleep hard. Ask God to wake you up. Oh, he's not going to answer. Oh, yes. If you really mean it, he's going to do that. Try it. Story in the story. I was in the army. And I would... It was against the law to have anything religious. And my girlfriend, my wife would send me long, terrible, terrible, horrible letters, like 20 pages letters, and she would write what she cooked and how she cooked it, and terrible, horrible. And then in the middle somewhere, she would put a paragraph from the prophecy and the Bible verse, because everything was censored by the security, by the communist government. And I knew she does that because they would read, read, and they say garbage, and they would just let me have the letter. And I would cut out the garbage, and keep the paragraph and the Bible verse and hide them in my clothes. I had a little flashlight and I would pray, Lord, wake me up before anybody wakes up. And God would, all the instruction, all the training started at 5.30. God would wake me up around 4 and under the blanket with a little flashlight so nobody would catch me because they would arrest me, I would study and pray. If you mean it, God is going to wake you up. Trust me. You just need to love him more than you love sleep. So he said to her, ask God to wake you up. If you mean it, he's going to use ice. He's going to wake you up. No worries. That night, she prayed, Lord, I really want to be connected, to be filled with your presence. Please do whatever it takes. Wake me up. Help me to start the day with you. She sleeps hard. He sleeps like a baby. As soon as something moves in the house, he's up. Around 5 a.m., the telephone started to ring, ringing, 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 forever. I don't know, an eternity, ringing, ringing. And eventually, she hears the phone like in a dream, and she doesn't know, am I dreaming or the phone is ringing? And she has a hard time, and eventually she wakes up, and the phone is ringing, ringing, ringing. And she says, why doesn't my husband hear? Is he dead? And she looks, and he's snoring, he's sleeping. Why doesn't he hear the phone? And then she says, why doesn't the answering machine pitch in? He should pitch after four rings, and she looks, and the answering machine is on. And she looks to the caller ID. Who is going to call at 5 a.m.? Who is crazy to call us, you know? And in the caller ID, says zero, 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 you know? She, says, she picks up the phone, says, hello. And she hears a voice. Lisa, I'm here waiting for you to pray. When Dr. Cluzet told us the story, I said, nah, <laughs> let me ask Lisa. I went to her and I asked her. And she said, Pavel, in the Bible many times angels come. In the Bible many times Jesus himself talks to us. That night, I prayed like never before. I said, I really want to wake up. And she said, the telephone, there was a voice that said, Lisa, I'm here waiting for you. It's time to pray. And I said, Pavel, I just then realized that God is waiting for me every morning and I am sleeping. And since that day, she said, I would rather die than to lose my relationship with my Jesus. And she said, since I started to do that, my life changed totally. And she says, now I walk with him and I love him more than life. Folks, as we close tonight, if you, you are a good Adventist, you love God, you are here. You could be home and watch a stupid movie, eat a pizza. If you are here, you need to go one step deeper. 
If you already wake up in the morning and you pray for one hour, go one hour and a half. Don't go five hours. If you don't, start with half an hour. But you need to take one step forward. You need to go deeper. You need to take it to the next level. You understand? And you need to keep doing that. You need to get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. And you need to make it the goal, the reason for your life. Because Jesus is coming indeed extremely soon. He is on his way. You cannot procrastinate. Eleanor says that by procrastinating, we harden our hearts until we become insensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So, God is calling you to make that decision and do it daily. How many of you want to do that? If you want to do that, and probably we don't have room, would you please come forward and we crowd each other here and pray together like one and say, Lord, help us from now on to make you a priority and daily fill our container with your presence, with the Spirit. Would you please come forward and express your decision to do that?